Hi, it's Martin and Arlo. Uh, we are almost to week four of isolation here in Vermont, and today we're going to make sourdough bread. So let's get to it. Okay, come on in, Anklem. Today we are going to make um, this bread that we call Moira's, Moira's bread. Uh, Moira is a friend of mine who is a very good home baker down in Connecticut. And I wrote this blog about Moore's bread and process because I felt like um, it was something that everybody who likes to make sourdough but who is challenged by the demands of sort of babysitting a, a mix over the course of a day, I thought everyone is going to like this, so that's what we're going to do today. Okay, um, let's start with uh, the divide. And just like always, I have to go out of order just a little bit. Apologies for that, but we're trying to show you how to make sourdough bread in half an hour, maybe a little bit more, probably a little bit more today. Um, I'm gonna talk about this when I get to the mix, but this is a dough that I mixed, oh, uh, what time is it? A little over 12 hours ago. It's had a little bit more than 12 hours. When I mixed it, uh, I put a piece of tape to show where sort of the high water mark was or where the dough was at the beginning of rise, and you can see that I've more than doubled all I really want is a doubling. Uh, if I get more than that, it's, it tells me that we're really active. And you can see from the top of this dough that it's quite active. It's definitely ready for a divide. So, let's see if I can get it to turn out here. Uh, it's a really nice active dough. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of the details of this, but they're all in the blog. Just search for um, the blog, which is titled, titled, Don't Be a Bread Hostage. We already have one loaf in the oven and it's ready to come out and here we go. So let's see how we did here. Uh, you see that? Some of you might say, whoa, 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 that's too much color. Um, but this is the amount of color that I like. If you want less color than that on your loaves, just bake it a little bit less. Um, to me, that's kind of, uh, there's a lot of flavor in that, so that's how I like it. This here, this here. Can you set that on the counter for just a second? Okay. Um, this recipe makes two loaves and both of them are in the 900-ish uh, range. That's 940. Let's see what this one is. 913, so we'll take just a titch off there. Um, I want you, pretty please, to, you Arlo, yeah. to um, appreciate those for me, would you? Uh, so just... just do your rounding thing that you know how to do. So okay. use that. Okay. Maybe describe the process as you're doing it. What'd you say? Describe that process as you're doing it. Like, not everybody knows how to pre-shape yet, so tell them what you're doing. Um, well, I want to tell someone the wrong thing. Yeah, but you, you know what you're doing. So, get yourself a little bit more flour. So, what are you doing there? Oh, uh, well, you're folding the edges into the center. Folding the edges to the center, and then what? And press the seal, right? Yeah. Work your way all the way around. And then what do you do? You just set it off to the side, right? We'll set it off to the side. We'll put a little bit of flour down. Yeah, that's good. That's perfect. That's perfect. That's all you need. So I shape the other one? Yeah, do the other one. Here, let's get some flour down. Yeah. It's okay to shape, to pre-shape with a little bit extra flour. It's okay. This is kind of, it feels like kind of a sticky dough, right? Yeah, sure. So up into the center, press to seal. This is the pre-shape. The pre-shape is gonna give a little bit of structure. This dough is like flabby. It's been relaxing for quite a while. So just pull it up and press it to the center. Yep, exactly. So that's our divide. Okay. So he's got this into kind of a rough round. It's just a gathering. You're not adding a lot of tension right now. He's just gathering it. And it's in a nice round form. We're gonna make rounds out of this. So now we can set it aside. Seam side down, and we'll cover it a little bit. There's that. Now, next thing I want to do is just show the mix. And the mix is pretty straightforward. There's really not a lot that is complicated about it. 
Um, maybe I'll talk for a second about the sourdough too culture. Okay, and I'm gonna bring that container back. Okay, so in the bowl I have um, white flour, and I have some whole wheat flour, and I've got a little bit of rye, and I can go ahead and add my salt, and I'll just mix those two combine. Now, here's the thing with this, um, this method and this recipe. The sourdough culture that I have is straight out of the fridge. It's a healthy culture. In fact, um, this one, which is the one that I used to make that loaf today, is uh, a starter that I only started like two weeks ago. So it's really like, um, actually that very loaf right there is the first loaf that I've made with that new starter. And I feel like um, that's something special. There's something that's unquantifiable about the excitement around that loaf. Um, even though I've been doing this a long time. Um, last night when that loaf was in the fridge shaped, I was thinking about it and uh, excited to bake and it came out really well, so I'm excited. So this is starter that has been fed and has been in a healthy state, but kept in the fridge. I'm not feeding it every day. I feed it, you know, going forward, I'll probably feed it like once or twice a week. I'm baking a little bit more than that. Um, and each time I bake, I'll give it a little bit of flour and water. But um, this is sort of a no discard and what we'd call unrefreshed starter method. So I have my flours with my salt. This is the container that I just dumped the dough out of that, I, um, that we divided. This is the container that it was in. And I'm just gonna reuse it. I don't need to wash it, it'll be fine. Um, over the past couple days and weeks actually, um, I've made this dough quite a few times. And what I've found is that for this time of year, um, I need to use about 90 degree water to get a dough temperature of 76. Um, if you're new to things like desired dough temperature, do a little bit of reading. There's good information on the website. Uh, and basically what we wanna do with the water temperature is set a proper course for fermentation um, of, the, of the dough because doughs will ferment at different rates based on ambient conditions or their temperature. And so that's a lot of words to basically say, our house is cool, it's about 65 right now, I'm using 90 degree water, I know that it works. Okay, so here is my 90 degree water. If you're in a place that's warm, maybe Florida or Panama or um, someplace that has nice uh, warm conditions, you're gonna wanna use colder water. Uh, and that's a process of, you know, getting to know one another, you and your dough. So, um, there's that. And, got my sourdough culture. This is the container that the dough is going to rise in. So, um, I'm just going to do everything in the same bowl. I'm going to take that. Thanks, buddy. And then, why don't you hook it back here and then give that a stir. Make, use your hand in a claw-like fashion and just give it a, yep. Yeah, just get that in there until it's homogenous. This is one of my favorite parts of baking, actually, is dispersing culture. If I'm mixing by hand, I think that that sort of dispersion of the culture in there is, feels good, right? Yeah, it's like nice warm water. Nice warm water, and... yeah. So that's pretty good. And now we're just gonna dump our uh, flour in there. And this recipe, um, this recipe is on the website in this article, um, that this don't be a bread hostage article, but I wanted to write it down here just in case anybody is just sort of, uh, looking for it on the fly. And basically I have 750 grams of all purpose flour. That's my nice King Arthur red and white bag. And then I have 250 grams of whole wheat. I ended up using about 200 of, of white whole wheat. And it's uh, this white whole wheat that I love so much from Farmer Direct, uh, this farming cooperative out in Kansas. Uh, if you look for an article that I wrote about them recently, uh, you'll get to see some of the faces who grow our flour. And I think that's like super special connection. Um, so I'm using a lot of the white whole wheat, but then I have some rye too. And I'm using about 50 grams of rye. But the moral of the story is that it's about three quarters all purpose, one quarter whole wheat or whole grain. Got that? and then 20 grams of salt, 750 grams of water, and 400 to 100 grams of starter. I'll talk about that in just a second. 
If you haven't studied Baker's percentages, or if that's a term that you're unfamiliar with, you might look around on the website for some resources which relate to that. Um, Baker's percentages uh, is a way of talking about ratios within the dough environment, the relationship between dry ingredients and wet ingredients, and it's a great way to begin to think about sort of the architecture of bread. So, there's that. Uh, flour goes in the bowl. I thought of a, of a better way to do that. Did I get it? I didn't spill anything. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, so like I said, this dough is going to live in this bucket. It's going to stay here uh, until we divide it 12 hours from now. Yeah. I might jump the gun on that because right now it's like uh, 1247, so I'm not going to stay up all night or into the deep night um, in order to do that. Probably I'll divide it like just before bed or something like that. Okay, so everybody's in the bowl and then I'm just gonna start to combine. Um, there are a lot of ways to do this. You could get in there with your hand, that'd be great. Um, When Moira makes this, she doesn't even really care if it's all if all the flour is hydrated. She just kind of throws it in and goes, and then comes back and folds. I am going to come back and fold, but I'm too uptight to like leave any dry flour bits in there. I got to make sure everybody's cool. So I like the handle end of the wooden spoon because I can clean it really quickly. If you use the other end, sometimes they have slots or something in them. It also has a lot more resistance at the fat end, so it's harder to get in there and turn it. But if I use the handle end, um, that's pretty much clean. I mean, I wouldn't put that back in the bucket, but it's gonna, it's gonna be okay like that. All right, thank you, sir. And let me see, we grab my thermometer, my infrared. This is warm. Uh, this feels warm right now. I can tell by putting my hands on it. I might've overshot the water a little bit because I was trying to figure out how much it would cool between when I drew the water and when we started filming. Um, but yesterday I got a temperature of like 77, 76, 77, and within 45 minutes it had dropped to 69 because our house is pretty cool. So, um, yeah, so this is 80, which is a little bit warm, um, <clears throat> but, but knowing how cool the house is today, um, it's going to be okay. I'm not worried about it. Like, and I've said this before, oftentimes in the home environment, um, bakers are dealing with underactive fermentation as opposed to overactive fermentation. Uh, it's not entirely true when you get down into warmer regions. You, you guys have a different uh, battle. But um, up here, I'm okay with a little bit of extra fermentation energy to start with. It's gonna cool down, everything be cool. Um, if you are in a warmer climate, and you get a 76 and it's 80 in the room and you see the dough going up, put it in a cooler place, find a dark spot, um, draw a bowl of cold water and put the bucket in the cold water and that will bring things down there. You're gonna learn those tricks, you're gonna learn the art of how to manage fermentation and it is an art. Okay, you set that aside for one second, thank you sir. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna shake. Okay, so, these doughs uh, could sit a little bit longer before we shake. It's not entirely necessary, but it wouldn't hurt them to sit a little bit longer. Um, before we shake, so these are going to proof in baskets. They're not gonna bake in these baskets. They are only going to ride in these baskets for the next 12 hours or whatever it is before we bake. I'll probably, Put them in right now and then honestly I probably won't bake them until tomorrow morning. It's okay if they hang out overnight, they will be fine. Um, so these are coiled willow baskets. Um, you see my tape measure over there? I think this basket is about nine inches across and about uh, three and a half high. It's about nine. Um, if you don't have, oh it's here, here I got it. You're on uh, centimeters. <laughs> Someone probably needs centimeters. Uh, yes. Eight and a half. Yeah, so eight and a half, nine. Okay. Um, 
If you don't have a banneton, what else can you use? Well, I have some mixing bowls which are about the same size. They're, they're a little bit shallower, but they're about the same size. You can use that as well. Um, and you can put a towel in it. You can put a dish towel in it. Don't use one of those dish towels that has like a pile to it. You want something that doesn't have uh, a real coarse grain. These are kind of like a, this is kind of a fine grained kind of junky kitchen towel. Um, and then you want to dust it. If you have problems with it sticking, some people will use a blend of rice flour and, um, and sort of whole wheat or something like that. I'm just using straight whole wheat. I tend to like whole grain flours for dusting unless I'm making a purely white loaf, in which case I don't really use the whole grain, I just use the white. Okay, can you see that quantity? Might look a little heavy. It's not super heavy, um, but those loaves are gonna be in there overnight, and so you wanna make sure that you have a decent amount of coverage. You wanna make sure you have pretty good coverage. I'm using a sifter because it's more accurate than I can sprinkle. If you sprinkle, you're bound to get lumps and it won't look as nice and even. Um, you can see, uh, you can see on this loaf that it's pretty even. Listen to this. It's like an ASMR. Oh my gosh, I smell that. Whoa, it smells so good. It smells good. It smells, it smells a little bit sour. Okay, so. Let's shape these side by side, okay? You and me. Okay. We'll walk you through it. You wanna see mine first? Would that be helpful though? Um, sure. Okay, so I'll do mine first. I've got a little bit of flour on the bench here. I don't have a ton. It's just like a wisp of flour. I can feel it with my fingers, but I don't perceive a lot of, I'm not shaping with clumps, like in clumps like that. So I'm gonna shape around. Same as the pre-shape. Okay. Same as the pre-shape, okay? Lift up and to the middle. Lift up and to the middle. And work your way around. You can already see some nice fermentation bubbles in this. It's really good. We're doing big or not small. Like not like big Yeah, those folds. are pig, pretty big folds, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I turn it over. And it's mostly there. It's mostly there. This last step will help you have a little bit more strength going into a long final rise. So this last step will give you a little bit more strength going into a long final rise. Um, sometimes you see people who have a loaf and didn't quite open with the energy that it might. Often that relates to shaping. Um, so I'm gonna give it a little bit more tension. And the way I do it is I make this sort of like circular thing with my hand. And you see how all of a sudden that looks much more perky, right? Yeah. It's a lot perkier. You can even see that like the, it has a little bit of shine to it because I have this nice um, strong shape. And then you can transfer using the peel with your right hand. And we'll leave that there. Okay. So. It's gonna be like, you got that big of a point? Yeah, that's perfect. And you don't have to put these into banneton. If you don't have bannetons, these are called bannetons. If you don't have bannetons, put it into a loaf pan. Put it into a tin, you know, like a metal loaf pan. And uh, follow the rest of the process pretty much exactly. Um, and that will work very well and you'll have a great sourdough um, sandwich loaf. So How's that I feel? Like that. Does that feel pretty good? Yeah. Okay, so you're pretty good there. Now, I'm gonna show you, so you can either do it the way that I did it with this sort of like, um, I always feel like I'm on a ship and I'm bringing in a sail or something. I've never done that, but, but what I want you to do is I want you to try an even um, more basic method. Basically, I'm going to hold my hands against the bench. Yeah. My hands aren't going to come up off the bench. I reach around them and I make a fence right here. Yeah. And I'm just going to pull. See how I pulled it like yeah. that? And then we're going to turn it and do it again. So you try that. So. Yep. And see how it's stretching as you pull it, stretching a little bit. Perfect. Perfect. And then we'll turn it and now do it again. Pulling it towards you, looking for the stretch. Yep, see how it's like stretching right there? And then wait, wait, let's just keep doing like that. Do that like two more times. Pulling towards you, don't let it move. Yep, yep, yep. See how it's stretching? You can even come further. See how it's stretching? Okay, yeah. And then turn it to where you're on the long axis again. And now pull and stretch. Pull it and you'll see it stretch. See that? Yeah. Feels tighter, right? And you can just keep doing that until you feel like you have some tension. How does that feel? Does it feel like it's pretty yeah. pretty good? Okay, so use this in your right hand and pick it up and then put it seam up in there. 
So like this? Yeah. So uh, think of where that seam is. You're okay. Think of where that seam is. So it's like right here. Yeah, perfect. And then would you just plop it in? Bam. Tomorrow morning, uh, when we bake those, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between the one that I shaped and the one that you shaped. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Definitely. You just bypassed like a how many thousands of loaves and did a great job shaping. Okay. Now, so we've seen the divide, the mix, the shape. Uh, we need to do one fold and then we need to load, but maybe we'll load first. Should we load now? I think we sure. should load now. Okay. So. This is the twin of the love of the of the loaf that already came out. I can't talk. <laughs> okay. This is the twin of the loaf that already came out. This batch is for two loaves, okay? So I baked one and I left the other one in the fridge. And then when I have a slot in the oven, I take it out and I get it ready to go in. So um, let me just show you. This is kind of like the before and after, right? So this is the one I just shaped. This is the one I just shaped. And this is the one which is fully proofed. This is the one that's fully proofed. It, the final proof was in the fridge. Um, and in the fridge, it still rises some, but really what's happening in the fridge is the cold, the cold conditions reduced yeast activity, but bacterial populations, which is kind of sciencey, continue to produce flavor. And so uh, that long cold rise is really important for that depth of flavor. Often it's the thing that kind of sets um, average bread apart from really good bread fermentation, right? Okay, so uh, we're going to load this. I want to talk for a second about um, I want to talk for a second about loading, and I'm just going to take this out because I want to demo something. That guy will be okay if he hangs out for a second. Okay, let's pretend that. Let's pretend that this is your proofed loaf, okay? Let's pretend that that is your proofed loaf. The way I'm going to get this thing into the oven is, uh, for this one, I'm going to put a piece of parchment like this, and then I'm going to invert it. This bag of rice. This is my loaf, my pretend loaf. <laughs> so I'm going to invert it like that, and then I'm going to use a razor blade to score it. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another way, so if you have a... Um, Dutch oven, a lot of people have these high wall, like uh, these ones with sides on them, which can be a little bit challenging, I think, to get the loaf into, especially if you want to score it. And um, I'll talk more about scoring when we get there in just a second. But what I would say is that um, if you can score it and you have a razor blade, I think it's a nice thing to do because it affects not only the beauty of it, but it allows the loaf to expand to its full potential in the oven. Okay. So one way that I like to get a loaf, uh, like my pretend loaf, into a hot pot like that is to use, I take a piece of parchment and I make this kind of shape. I don't know what that is. It's like a belt. It's kind of like a belt. Yeah, it's fancy. It's like a rodeo belt or something like that. Kind of. Okay. So I put it on top like that. Invert it over. And then, then I go here and I grab my pretend, my uh, lawn. Grab my razor blade, and I go in and I score whatever you want to do. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, can you put that back over there? Thank you. So I have my score, and then I've got my hot pot, and now I can lower it in because I have this little sling. I like that. It's so good that I can take it in and out, uh, and it's a very handy way to do it. If you don't have a Dutch oven, you can cook or bake bake um, in a preheated um, you know, stock pot like that, that will work too. The Dutch ovens have a little bit more mass and so they retain heat better. Um, what else would I say about that? If you are anytime, if you're using metal, metal conducts heat better than other things like cast iron. And so just be aware that you might, uh, risk burning the bottom. Parchment underneath helps provide some insurance against doing that. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So let's load. Just put this loaf back in its happy place. Okay. So should I do this over here? It'd be easier to do it over here, I think. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. Let's do it over here. Um, okay. And grab 
two more of these guys. Okay. So I'm gonna bake this one on my uh, this cloche that I have that looks like that. And do I have some more parchment? I'll grab a little piece of parchment. Oh, here it is. It's hiding from me. Okay. Again, I like to have things on the parchment. Um, if I'm baking on metal, even with the cast iron, I tend to leave, um, I tend to have parchment underneath because you, depending on the oven, you can get a little bit too dark on the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna go in, just kind of turn it over. You could have done my trick too with the, uh, you could have done my trick where you put the parchment on and then slide it on. That's one way you can do it. The other way you could do it is if you have um, a board like this, some people call them flip em, flipping boards or uh, transfer peels. You could put the loaf on there and then slide it in. Uh, the transfer peel can be very handy. I, for years I used, um, for years I used a double thickness, a double thickness of cardboard at home and it works fine. Okay, Arnold, can you bring that uh, razor blade one more time? Be careful, there you go. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, scoring. Uh, okay, and I'm going pretty fast, I apologize. Um, what I'm talking about here is a relationship with bread which extends for many, many, many years, uh, which you can foster and grow. If you go look at the blog, look at how gorgeous Moira's um, loaves are. Don't expect to make that tomorrow or even next week. Um, it's gonna take some repetitions and some practice, um, but it's craft and it's worth the time, it's worth the investment, and in the meantime, you can eat your mistakes. Okay, I'm gonna score this loaf. I recommend that you begin with either a simple um, cross like that, or if you wanna do a box, a box is another option. I think I'll do a box for this because you already saw a cross. So for the box, I'm just making a square. I really like it if the points intersect, the loaf will do better if the points intersect. So I'm just making sure that they intersect. And then we'll put a thing like that. And heads up. The lid on. Carl, will you grab that? Thank you. Let's go here. Okay. Um, if you have, uh, you want to take this? If you have, um, if you have work gloves or like we have wood stove gloves, that's a really good thing to use to move those pots around. They're hot and you will burn yourself. Uh, even if you're very careful, um, it's hard to avoid some burns. Just do your best to be careful. Um, maybe what I should say about loading too is if you do not have Dutch ovens, um, you can bake those on a baking stone. Just make sure to steam your oven. The steam is what will help the loaf rise to its full potential. And I definitely recommend that. Um, I want to do two more things. I want to show a fold of the dough. And I also want to just cut an end off that loaf, even though it's not quite ready for that. Uh, but I do want to. So let me grab this dough. And this here. Okay, Anthem, look in there. And you're going to see that that's just shaggy. There's really nothing um, happening in terms of development yet. But, but, um, in the next hour or so, I'm going to fold this a couple times, like every 15 minutes. And I want to show you something. Look at the amount of development. There's not much there right now. It's kind of loose. But I'm going to go around this for just a minute. I think in the article I say like four times, but you can go more than that. If it feels like it's a little bit soft, um, just go until you feel the dough begin to gain a little bit of tension, and then you can stop. And if you watch this, 
If we could come back in 15 minutes, you would see this sort of transformational process happening where the dough would have a lot more um, strength and elasticity. Um, but that's it. That's basically um, the mix. I mean, well, you already saw the mix, but that's a fold. And then that's going to sit for uh, that's going to sit for another 15 minutes, something like that. Um, Arlo, let's uh, let's cut a slice, a small slice off that loaf. Can you grab our bread knife from the rack? It's over on the drying rack. Okay. okay. Just clean my hands for a second. You can take the bread knife over there. Um, and let's see how we did. Um, can you see that anthem? The loaf is um, really light for its size, and that's one of the hallmarks of whether or not a loaf is done. People will thump it and sometimes say, you know, it has a hollow sound. Um, and some people will use a probe thermometer. What I found is that the loaf will actually reach the temperature that a lot of people are looking for during baking earlier than uh, the point at which the loaf is fully baked. Um, a nice full bake affects flavor. It also affects uh, structure as well as moisture leaves. So this could probably sit for a couple hours, um, but I just wanna see what the inside looks like. And we've got another one that we can treat uh, really, really properly. So maybe I'll cut just a little bit. It's not super open. I think that we could have gone in a little bit earlier than this. And this is the 75% hydration one. Uh, if I'm dealing with like the 80% hydration one, I get a little bit more open structure. Um, but the smell is really good. And that's that um, brand new baby starter. This is the first uh, loaf from the new starter. So. So thank you for coming along with this. Um, I hope this video is helpful in some way. Um, sourdough is a process. Bread making is a process. And I encourage you to um, take, for some, take some of these early steps to develop your craft. And I guess I would only add that um, the sun's out today and we're excited that spring is coming. Uh, flowers are finally up a little bit around here and that's giving us some hope today and uh, we want to say that our family is thinking of your family and look for the hashtag bake with us as we make our way through this cheers mm, this is really good crunchy very flavorful mm -hmm. it's pretty sour yeah it's more sour than normal mm -hmm. it's like robust yeah maybe the characteristic of this new starter very good. Thanks, y'all.